me gain access to books um, that I needed despite the, and they helped me despite the pandemic um, that limited their resources. Finally, a huge thank you to my family for their support and encouragement of my work. Um, and at this time, I'll start my uh, PowerPoint. Um, so to teach argumentative writing in freshman composition, I often use the Chrysler television commercial to talk about Aristotle's means of persuasion. The ad shows a centenarian sharing advice about life, suggesting the idea that expertise and know-how are what make, um, oops, sorry about that guys. Oh God, okay. Uh, are what make Chrysler a re reliable automobile. The commercial ends with the following adage delivered by an elderly man, his finger pointed at the camera, never forget where you came from. I often think about that pointy finger, the wise old face, wrinkly mouth and deep set eyes. I'm convinced the, the man is looking directly at me and wonder if he can tell that I am an imposter ethnic. Of course, I can say with certainty that I was born in the seaport city of Karachi, Pakistan, but to say that I am Pakistani does not acknowledge the whole of me. I grew up in the Middle East, London, England, and Texas. Add to this the fact that my name is diametrically opposed uh, to each other. Uh, Farah, the anglicized, two versions of my name, Farah, the anglicized version, and Farah, which any Urdu speaker will insist is the correct pronunciation because it takes inspiration not from Farrah Fawcett of Charlie's Angels, but from Farah, the wife of the Shah of Iran, after whom many baby girls from Pakistan in the 60s and 70s were named. Hence, to reckon with my past, to tell the truth about where I came from, I've decided it's best to say that home for me is that border uh, that liminal space between geographical and geopolitical landscapes, the Orient and the Occident, between cultures, conservative and liberal, between languages, Urdu and English, between religions, Islam and Christianity. I was born into Islam, but attended Catholic schools in my formative years. To be clear, I'm not the only inhabitant of this borderland. It has been claimed by many writers the feminist Chicano writer Gloria Anzaldúa uh, among them. For Anzaldúa, known for her seminal work, Borderlands, La Frontera, living on the border is, as she says, a constant state of transition, which makes it a transformative space where one has to learn to survive. To do that, one must create, in her words, a new element, a third space, which Anzaldúa says can be exciting because it makes those living on the border participants in the quote future evolution of humankind end quote. Here Enzaldua issues a cautionary note about the constant state of being in unfamiliar territory that results from living between two worlds. While energizing it is quote never comfortable she says as you are always being told to make a choice because of, quote, society's clamor to uphold the old, to rejoin the flock, to go with the herd, end quote. Similarly, South Asian writer Jhumpa Lahiri views the straddling of borders as feeling like she was never loyal to either, but always trying to please both sides of her. Sherman Alexie offers the most optimistic perspective on living between borders in his interview with journalist Bill Moyers. And I'm going to quote from his passage. I've come to realize it's pretty magical. I can be in a room full of Indians and non-Indians because I'm ambiguously ethnic looking. I can be anything. People generally think I'm half of whatever they are. So I end up feeling like a spy in the house of ethnicity. So I get to hear all the secrets and jokes. As Alexi suggests, there are definite advantages to living between two worlds. I have embraced my ability to switch to Urdu when I need to talk privately in public. And I much prefer a spiced tandoori turkey 
at Thanksgiving than I do a simple salt and pepper one. For the most part, however, the in-between space is as Anzildua suggests, uncomfortable. Now that I am in middle age, I'm tired of being uncomfortable. I've decided that I will always occupy a space of difference in the United States. And in order to be at ease with this reality, I must move to a place where I won't be consumed by worry about which side of my hyphenated identity I'm betraying. To get there, I must do what one does when she moves, inventory what I need, discard what I don't, and pack what I absolutely cannot do without. This sabbatical has been a journey to finding the kernel, kernels of my roots to replant them in the new space for my survival and the survival of my future generations. I hope my discoveries also help others who live on border, in border spaces, which according to Ansel Dua, are more ubiquitous than one might think. She defines borders as, quote, physically present wherever two or more, cult more cultures edge to each other, where people of different races occupy the same territory, where under, lower, middle, and upper classes touch, where the space between two individuals shrinks with intimacy, end quotes. In essence, we are all living on the outskirts of one thing or another. My idea was set in motion with a need to reacquaint myself with Pakistan, where I was born and lived until age eight. Being a teacher of literature, I thought the country's literati would be the best source for reconnecting with the place I once called home. I began with a simple list of questions about Pakistani literature written in English. Who are the writers? What are they writing about? And is it worth reading? I envisaged a semester of reading stories, poems, plays, and essays, after which I would curate a list of authors and titles to share with my colleagues for their consumption and the consumption of their students. I didn't realize that this reading list would lead me down a circuitous path through history, geography, politics, and culture of India and Pakistan, the old with the new, um, which would unearth um, the old with the new, which would unearth items I had to bring with me to the new that transformative third space in between borders where I needed to learn to live more comfortably. Each, excuse me, each text I read beckoned me to travel farther than the Indus River where Karachi is to a much deeper and darker past of how Pakistan came to be. In sharing the following creation story, if you will, I do not mean to give a history lesson, rather, my point is to suggest that it is this time travel that planted the seeds from which I have grown over the duration of this sabbatical. My family is from Hyderabad, India, a southern city of India. The city's geographical location is, um, protected its inhabitants from the immediate impact of the partition period. So-called because when they were leaving India, the British forced new borders to separate Hindus and Muslims, resulting in the formation of Pakistan and then eventually Bangladesh. Contrary to what the word suggests, partitioning India was not as simple as unzipping a jacket or even as precise and well thought out as what historian Yasmin Khan notes in her book, The Great Partition, the metaphor of surgery would imply. Serial Radcliffe, um, Serial Radcliffe, a British judge, was taxed with creating the boundary lines and is famously known to have done the job from a distance without visiting India. Overnight, people found themselves having to pick sides. In the process of migration, emotions ran high and led to more than a million lives lost, 75,000 to 100,000 rapes and abductions and at 14 million forced migrations of those fleeing ethnic cleansing and near genocide-like conditions, the partition period remains to this day the single largest mass migration in world history. And to think this happened only a few years after the Holocaust and around the same time as the formation of Israel and Palestine. 
Once India and Pakistan were formally de declared separate countries, India went to work to unite its many independent princely states as one nation. Hyderabad, which was governed by Muslim leadership, resisted giving up its independence, a move that engulfed the area in widespread violence to which my family fell victim. An uncle had to abandon his radio repair shop and flee for his life when the Indian authorities got wind of his plan to help his brother escape to Pakistan. Another uncle never returned home from work one day. My family later learned that he had been lined up and shot execution style by the police who mistook him for a freedom fighter against India's unification. His mother is said to have kept watch at the door for his footsteps until the day she died. And in 1951, my own father left India at the age of 20 to become one of thousands of Muslims who between 1947 and 1975 crossed a small section of the Thar Desert in Northwest India to enter Pakistan on foot. There are famous pictures of refugees and immigrants crossing this border now readily available on the internet. One image of a line of people in white often presents itself to me. I imagine my father in that procession walking in step with other refugees toward the new land into an unknown future to start his life anew in a country that was, that was as unsure of itself as, was, as he was about what it meant to be an immigrant in search of home. Excuse me, to arrive at an understanding of the extent to which historical epochs shaped the hit trajectory of my people, I read widely everything from the historical, from historical epochs, uh, excuse me, monographs on the partition, essay collections by academics, personal accounts, short stories in translation, and even poetry. My reading was informed and has informed an edited collection of short stories and poetry by Pakistani Anglophone writers that I am working on. I've also curated a list of titles that I will share at the end of this presentation, but that's the work I did to satisfy the academic in me. More important is the significance of this project to me as a writer and teacher that I did not anticipate and was not aware of until I started to reflect on, on this experience. The essence of this reflection invigorates the following lessons, and I promise there's only three. Um, taking risks pays off. Until I embarked on this project, I had read only one Pakistani Anglophone writer, a Babsi Sidwa, author of Cracking India, and was not aware of too many others, except maybe Mohsen Hamid, because his book, Reluctant Fundamentalist, about 9-11 had been adapted into a major motion picture in 2013 starring Riz Ahmed. Thus, I, I was surprised to discover the vastness of the canon. In 2017 alone, there were 20 new English novels by Pakistani writers. Of course, the publishing industry is a business driven by market forces. And in this case, it was 9-11 that gave rise to the sudden demand for everything having to do with Pakistan and Muslims. Writers were eager to either reinforce stereotypes or refute them in their stories. What surprised me the most wasn't so much the plot lines as, um, as much as the writing style. Each writer I turned to wrote in such an unequivocally Pakistani voice that I was caught off guard. Never before had I seen in books, Urdu words and cultural references that I was only used to hearing in the privacy of my own home or among the Pakistani diaspora. I had been reading Indian writers all my life, Jhumpa Lahiri, Arundhata Roy, and Bharati Mukherjee, to name a few. Hence, it wasn't as if renditions of South Asian culture and literature were all that new to me. Hence, it wasn't, oh, excuse me, what surprised me about the Pakistani writers I read was that the culture they were giving voice to was intimately familiar to me, much more than the Indian cities of Calcutta or Kerala that Lahiri and Roy write about. Here's just one example to illustrate my point. H.M. Nakhli, in his latest novel, Selected Works of Abdullah the Cossack, which is set uh, in, in Karachi, makes casual references 
to its land, um, excuse me, uh, makes casual references to its landmarks and Urdu words and phrases to paint a picture of the city as cosmopolitan. As we follow Abdullah, the novel's 70 year old protagonist in his search for meaning in the waning years of his life, we learn about the etymology of the word seersucker as in he wore a seersucker as having roots in the Urdu kheer and shakar or pudding and sugar. Imagine my delight in reading this phrase that I had only heard used in my childhood to talk about someone who is very sweet or at least fiends sweetness now being used in an English novel published in the West. Local landmarks such as the Empress Market, Sadar Bazaar and the Abdullah Shah Ghazi tomb that form the backdrop of, my, of many stories my family tells about their time in Karachi are mentioned freely in Nakhwi's book. He even remembers the city in the same way my family reminisces about it. And here's a quote from this, his pa a passage from the book. It is a gorgeous evening, the sort that reminds you of why one resides in Karachi. The stars are like spilled sugar across the sky and the breeze is cool and salty like lassi. The reaction this evoked in me was similar to what Kevin Kwan, author of Crazy Rich Asians, said when he first read Amy Tan's The Joy Luck Club, and I'm quoting him, Amy Tam was the first person reflecting back to me my own experiences. Nakwi and other authors I read liberated me to express myself more freely, and I began to realize that I must trust my readers willingness to go where I want to take them without sacrificing my voice or authentic self to get them there. The creative work I delved in during my sabbatical does exhibit a freer voice as I have allowed myself to use vocabulary words and language from my own culture. In the past, the audience I envisioned was always Western and I felt compelled to censor myself from using cultural terms and references. For example, a poem I recently wrote and published references betel leaves, but I used the Urdu word for it without any explanation. I struggled with this at first and was going to take it out or go with betel, but for some reason, betel did not have the same rhythmic flow as its equivalent bond in that context. And I decided to go with the latter. I have received much praise from my readers many of whom talk about the way that sentence takes flight, meaning takes off with a beat and rhythm of its own. Taking the risk to, to be my authentic self paid off. And I have since resolved to encourage my students to more freely express themselves. Lesson two, revision is transformative. I grew up listening to fairy tales, mostly from the Hans Christian Andersen tradition, Hansel and Gretel, Goldilocks and Three Bears, and Jack and the Beanstalk. My father would put my sister and me to bed after telling us these stories using special voices for the different characters. This oral tra tradition wasn't just reserved for bedtime. It was part of our daily lives. Storytelling came naturally to my family members. Every time they gathered in my parents' home in Karachi, my aunts and uncles would turn their thoughts eastward to India, the place of their childhood. They tell tales about everything from how rishtas or marriage arrangements came to be, relatives down on their lot to fascinating tales of my ancestors' encounters with jinns. The only problem was, save for the bedtime stories, I never really listened. Back then, their talk was nothing but background noise. Now that I have learned about the history of my people, I feel guilty and wished I could revise a few things. I wish I could turn back time and place myself next to my grandmother and take copious notes on the stories she told of growing up in India under the British rule of the way she transgressed and dared to earn her own money as a young widow, first as a fruit seller and then as a nanny, driven by the need to feed her children and prove to the world that she could be a single mother of five in the India of the 1940s. Slowing down to pay attention to the stories, to the ideas that really matter, 
is something I started to apply to writing during my sabbatical. Of course, the gift of time helped, but seeing revision as an opportunity to be more alive in the story's presence has made it easier to revisit my past. In this way, revision became that liminal space that according to Anzal Dua has transformative powers. Who wouldn't want to be in a place full of energy where things happen, I thought. Thus began my quest to revise my work. I started to see revision as clearing space in my mind to make room for new envisioning. It was not unlike my mother's sewing projects. I remember accompanying her to fabric stores in London where she would browse through shelves and shelves of sewing patterns until she found the perfect white packet of Simplicity and Macau dress designs for my sister and me. When it was time to sew, she would clear space on the dinner table, spread out the fabric, lay the thin, thin brown tracing paper patterns on top of it, and pr pr proceed to cut it into frocks, pinafores, and the more cultural shawar kameez dresses my sister and I always wore. For my mother, what lay in front of her was an exciting opportunity to be creative as she went about her business of clothing and taking care of her children. Now that I'm more determined to be dedicated to the craft of writing, every time I revise, I imagine clearing out space to work on a chunk to shape what's there into a medium through which to express myself. For me, revision is also a labor of love to see how I can thread ideas through words from beginning to end in my own voice. I'm proud to say that this fresh perspective on revision Revising of seeing the past anew is what enabled me to persist with the writing I did during my sabbatical. It is the reason why I believe I was able to finally get published. I'm hoping to use the fresh perspective I've gained on revising to help my students realize that it is in the shaping, cutting, and stitching where the real work of writing happens. I know it's a lofty goal, um, both as a teacher and writer, but as the great Toni Morrison said in her Nobel Prize acceptance speech, we know you can never do it properly once and for all. Passion is never enough, neither is skill, but try. Lesson three. The past is the present. One of the first things I did when I began my sabbatical in January was to attend Modern Language Association's conference 2021, virtually, of course. As those in the humanities know, MLA's conference is what we turn to update ourselves on the latest and greatest in our field. Browsing through the schedule this year, I noticed several presentations on the theme of decolonizing the curriculum a movement that expands the Western canon to do what Cameroonian philosopher Achille Membe says is a planetary enterprise, a radical openness of and to the world, a deep breathing for the world as opposed to insulation. When I first came across that word used in the context of pedagogical, in the context of pedagogical concerns, I assumed it was a fancy term for diversifying one's readings to include authors and titles outside of the Western canon. But having had the experiences I have had this semester, having read as widely as I have about South Asia, about Pakistan, the partition period, about the geographical locations of the country of my birth and the role it played in expanding American imperialism, I realized the real worth in diversifying one's curricula is in its power to inspire students to pay attention to the world beyond their physical and imagined borders so that they can be more cognizant of our interconnectedness as humans, a truth so well underscored by the pandemic. As most historians know, studying the past teaches us about the present and the future, but what good is the past if it doesn't reflect the full extent of human experiences? What good is the look back we as teachers offer if it is only focused on the dominant narrative, the story of the world according to the Western perspective? Here, 
I return to the partition of India and Pakistan. My Western education did not teach me about the extent of the carnage of this tragic time in the lives of South Asians, even though, as I noted earlier, it took place around the same time as the Holocaust. As I delved into the details of the partition and the formation of Pakistan, um, the geopolitics of the region came into full view, leading me to recognize that Pakistan is not as insignificant to the United States as our educational curriculum might lead us to believe. As a country, as a country, um, Pakistan does not get much attention in social studies, but even a brief overview will illustrate how strategically important this region has been to us. During the height of the Cold War, um, United States waged a proxy war with Russia in the arid mountains of Afghanistan, using its neighboring land in Pakistan as a passage through which to supply weapons to the Afghan militia, which was largely made of religious mullahs who eagerly used them to stave off the Russian army that had in the 80s hoped to expand its stronghold in the region by seizing control of Afghanistan. The plan worked and the Russians retreated, setting off a chain of events that brought an end to the Cold War. The story would have ended there with a victory for the US, except that the weapons we had provided the Afghan fighters were still lying around in the mountains all over Afghanistan. Those weapon fell, weapons fell into the hands of, of jihadists, such as Osama bin Laden, who by this point was annoyed by Western involvement in the region. This was a recipe for disaster with momentum and power so strong that it toppled two towers and killed more than 3,000 people on American soil. What does all this have to do with decolonizing the curriculum, you might ask? My point here is to simply connect the dots to underscore the idea that it is our job as educators to help students interrogate assumptions, think more critically about the world so that they can be more woke to our role in it. To avoid another tragedy like 9-11, we as educators need to help our students recognize that United States is not the world, but a part of it decolonizing the curriculum is one way to get there. And I just want to, before I conclude the presentation, I wanted to share a, a brief summary of uh, a survey that I conducted back in the spring of 2021, um, asking my colleagues in the English department about their efforts to decolonizing the curriculum. And um, I'm pleased to report that uh, most faculty do assign a variety of texts and their selections vary from semester to semester and of course from class to class. Of those who completed the survey, almost everyone indicated that they currently discuss writings about topics such as racism and inequality. The findings were also reassuring in that many indicated that it is important for students to develop a diverse perspective and understanding of others' experiences. But the most um, useful finding, I believe, were the challenges that faculty noted in their efforts to decolonize effectively. Focusing on the challenges and obstacles offers an entry into helping us do better. Faculty indicated not feeling comfortable discussing writings by people of color as a non-BIPOC or wanting a person or wanting more discussion with, within the department before including more writings by people of color. A couple of people mentioned wanting to ensure that by including writings by BIPOC, people they are doing more than just checking off boxes. And I'll just read a few quotes from my survey. I'm always kind of worried of speaking for other groups I don't belong to. I don't want to dis do disservice to their stories. It's not enough to simply put them on your syllabus to satisfy some external cr cr criteria. We need to consider how writers of color experience the world and how that shapes our own identities. And finally, the ongoing issue will continue to be how we make multicultural texts and authors integral to curriculum. How do we position these authors within the course design structure so that they are not an addendum to the canon? 
And I thought in sharing that, uh, if there's ever a need to have a, a further conversation, um, we can use that as a branch and off point. So just to conclude uh, my uh, presentation, I'll go back to my conclusion. I realized that by ending my presentation with the lesson on decolonization, I have come full circle back to the idea of borders. The fight to end colonization created nation states and borders, whereas Anzaldúa suggests change and transformation happens. To survive in this in-between space, we need to adapt, merge the old with the new. But in reality, it isn't as simple as it sounds. I should know, because as I mentioned as at the start of this presentation, even after living in the West for nearly 40 years, I'm still unsure of what to call myself. My name, Farah, is a reflection of my lived experiences in the West. And to call me Farah, would be to deny the whole of me. However, now that I'm connected with people from Pakistan on a professional level, thanks to the work I have done during my sabbatical, I'm compelled to think more about whether I want to continue to be Farah or Farah. This question must be answered soon. I will be returning to Pakistan in the winter after more than 20 years. Pakistan is piloting a community college model of education and the American Institute of Pakistan Studies, a state department agency has issued a grant to me and two of my colleagues from Illinois and Arizona to travel to Lahore and Islamabad for professional develop development workshops. Once I step foot on Pakistani soil, I will be called Farah, but Paul and Rob, the other grant recipients and my traveling companions uh, will want to know what I prefer, Farah or Farah. I'm leaning towards Farah because it acknowledges the Western side of me, but I, but I remain in between where I will always be. I would have been upset about this at one time, that I can't make up my mind, that I don't know who I am, or worse, that I'm a sellout, an assimilationist, but that is who I am, the person in that uncomfortable place in between. I call this place home. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> that. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't want to say anything. This is, that was, that was such a great, um, <clears throat> all the way through. But that that was a powerful yeah. ending. <laughs> See, I knew it. Yeah. That was awesome. That was awesome. And in 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 my role, I will speak now, just in order to open it up to questions, to the conversation. Again, uh, it, we're in this space, and so let's run with it and let's talk. So, if anybody wants to unmute or chat, if you're not comfortable unmuting and, and talking, then put it in the chat, um, and I'm going to step back and let it go. And if, and if no one wants to talk, then I have a few things that I'd love to ask, but I'll wait. I'm going to wait. So far, I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, this professional development that you're going to be embarking on. Uh, my, the presentation was fantastic. I'm really, really um, in awe of everything that you said, and I'm really curious about uh, what, how the professional development that you'll be participating in is going to help you continue on your journey. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that question, Mike. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, the American Institute of Pakistan Studies um, likes, it, it, it's, uh, it, their goal is to promote understanding and acceptance of differences and tolerance through education, and they often send people to different parts of the, the world, and, and Pakistan is, is one place that they encourage people to go because of the, you know, the, the geopolitics of the region. There's a lot of... Um, on the part of the people of Pakistan, there is a lot of uh, negativity when they think of the West and especially the United States. And they wanna use this as an opportunity to promote more understanding. And um, although the excuse is that we're going there to talk about a community college model, really what we're doing is taking, um, so my colleagues and I from those places in Illinois and Arizona, have particular books from Pakistani authors that they are um, teaching. 
and they want to go there to um, get some feedback on how um, how to better develop that curriculum for that for that novel or for the for those, that selection of essays. What is it that they're missing? Uh, how can they address the stereotypical images of Pakistanis and Muslims or even that whole area? And so in getting the feedback from people from Pakistan, uh, we'll be able to then uh, develop our curriculum uh, in a more uh, critical way. And likewise, we want to give feedback to people over there on uh, text, American text that they're using um, to, to help them develop their curriculum in the same way that we're hoping for help from them. I was just gonna um, mention something, Farah, that this is so memorable. It's such a memorable thing you've, you've, you've done for, for the Academy, but uh, speaking personally, this is the type of scholarship that really resonates because it's, it's so rooted in the personal, it's so rooted in your story. And I just want to acknowledge that as such, it puts you in an extraordinarily vulnerable position. And I appreciate that when you say you're a little nervous, I, I would be too, because you're anchoring so much of this deep dive into this, um, you know, certainly academic pursuit, but it's also autobiography and it's linked and it makes it probably the most powerful uh, way of conveying knowledge. And instead of it just being this external um, academic pursuit. So I, I just wanna honor what you've done. It's just really Thank powerful. You. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate that. Farah, or Farah. Okay. <laughs> I still said it wrong. Um, I was thinking that this is such an incredible professional opportunity for you to be going to Pakistan on such an adventure. It's just mind blowing to me, but how does it feel inside of you to know that you're going to like the home of your family and you haven't been there in so long? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. I'm uh, nervous and excited. Um, uh, but I think mostly excited because, you know, uh, just to just to go back uh, and to to be there. I'm not going to Karachi. That's where that's the only Pakistan I know. Uh, I've never been to Islamabad. I've never been to Lahore. So these will be new for me as well. Uh, and I've never been back to Pakistan on, on a professional level. So uh, a lot of it is going to be very new for me. Um, uh, and I, I, I don't know what to expect in a way, uh, but at the same time, I'm excited. Can I ask a question that, uh, and you can say pass, because it does get more personal. I just am reacting to the personal, um, and I'm wondering how all of this has now impacted you as a mother and how you view your own children and their identity and their in-betweenness as well, if mm. you're comfortable sharing. Do you have time for coffee afterwards, Sandy? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Um, yeah, I think this, you know, this in-betweenness uh, is something I've personally struggled with so much for so long. And I think uh, you bringing that up is, is quite interesting because um, my daughter, who's actually here, uh, does a blog for uh, UMass uh, called Third Culture Kid. And I don't think she knows this, but in a way, her work has inspired me to, to delve deeper into my own in-betweenness in a way that I hadn't in the past. Um, and I can only, I think, I don't know if the struggle is more difficult for her or for me, because I see my children being more, even more Western than I am, right? And it's actually at this point, it's more about me because now I have to accept that. I have to accept them being even more Western than me. And that is the struggle for me that I am trying to come to terms with. 
because it means letting go of a lot more of the culture and maybe even the language. Use that, please. Tara, this is Joyce. I was thinking the same thing as Sandy. How was your daughter on this journey? Because I see this as your beginning, as great as your sabbatical was. This is sounds like feels like a lifetime vocation for you. And I'm so honored that you shared it with us because this was great, just great. Thank I, you, Joyce. Thank you. Yeah, so I talk much. to my I talk to my students about their roots, about their heritage all the time. And I find that some students are so um, in denial or they think, oh, no, I, there's nothing for me to learn about myself from going back. And I said, oh, there's everything to learn. And yeah. not as eloquently as you, but when they present some things they do learn, I know this is their beginning. So I'm going to share, I'm going to share your three lessons with them. And, okay. um, and I'm, I'm sure. excited that, um, once again, this was a delight, Farah. And I just really thank appreciate you. you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for being here. I did want to share that I have a curated list of readings for anybody who's interested in, uh, uh, you know, checking out uh, Pakistani literature. I'd be happy to share some of those titles. Hey, I'll share. Hey, Thanks. 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 Um, so, Farah, I was... First of all, I'm totally blown away by your talk. Thank you so much. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and I'm so happy to see uh, you arrive at this place after a long time of, um, of traveling down a certain road. <laughs> so thank you and uh, really just awe-inspiring. Um, so I was thinking about when I first met you and uh, about 15 years ago now, and how much since then I've learned from you about writing. And you know that I've always said to you uh, how, how much I admire the shape of your lesson plans and the way you think about writing and uh, offering those lessons to your students. And because um, what lies underneath it, I've always thought about you as just a constant pursuit of, of skill but also a constant pursuit of integrity and putting your heart behind your work. Um, and I'm so grateful to you for what, uh, for working with you all these years and learning so much about writing and talking to you so many times about writing. Um, and I'm just so glad for you that you've had this opportunity and uh, grateful for your work. So congratulations. Uh, yeah, thank you, so thank awesome. you very much, Denise. I, I don't want to step on toes. Like I, I, I have like a, a cut, just a couple of little like questions, but I, I want to, I want to make sure everybody else gets the opportunity because I've got, I've got Farah's email chain and I can ask these later. So, <clears throat> oh, JP, see, this is exactly why. JP, go ahead. Or is he? This is a goof. Sorry, <laughs> I'm forced to be on my phone. So everything is just more difficult. Um, I just wanted to say one thing that that um, was a really important point to me that you made Farah was the transformative nature of revision. And I thought the regret you had about um, not hearing the stories your, your grandmother was telling and how you do things differently um, was a really important part of your talk. And I wondered if you shared that with our students who might not feel that same sense of the excitement as being part of that, um, you know, revision space. Yeah, that's that's a good question. It it, it actually goes back to the essence of my talk. Um, um, up until recently, or actually, maybe I would say this semester, um, I didn't really used to talk about myself. I didn't talk about you know. Here I am, you know, minority uh, from this place, that place, you know, I, I didn't really address that. Um, but um, 
now I what I've tried to do in light of everything that I've ex, you know talked about, I tried to I've take I've reduced the number of assignments so that I can spend more time in the revision state. I really emphasize to them the idea of uh, you know revising. We spend more time on revising. At least that's what I'm doing now this semester with their first essay. We're still on the first you know the first essay. We're still talking about uh, you know doing different drafts, maybe multiple drafts, and being okay with making changes. Um, I I don't know JP if I'm answering your question. Um, I guess the best way to answer that would be to for me to share more personal stories with my students about my own revision process. And um, I think I think I, can, I I feel comfortable enough now to be able to do that. But in the past, I know I wasn't. Yeah, you would certainly answer my question, Kara. I, I think. Um, that lesson is very almost parental to our students, right? Yeah. Don't do what I did, kind of the regret. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it. I'm gonna um <clears throat> gonna piggyback on JP's point in a minute. But I, we have a, a question in the chat about asking you to reflect about the role of learning a language from multicultural decolonization curricula. So about learning so. I'm sorry. I'm learning, I'm sorry, I'm losing you, Brian. Learning yeah. a language. Yeah, uh, about learning a language for a multicultural decolonized curricula. Okay. So, uh, how, like, how, the how role, do. The role of learning a language in okay. that process. Right, right. Okay. Um, like for my own experience, like if, if, I guess if I if I'm talking about like learning, you know, Spanish, um, I think a lot of the times, um, I guess helping students realize that English, like for example, if I talk, talk I'll give the example of my ESL students um, in my classes. Um, I tell them that English isn't like they worry about, you know. Uh, accents. They worry about uh, uh, lear learning English as the most important thing. And I, I try to get them to think that, to realize that English is, is an international language. It isn't just a language of the West. You know, it, it's, it's an international language at this point. And um, not to let that intimidate them, because I mean, I think about myself. I thought learning English as a child, I was taught that learning English was 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 the thing. That was why my father moved us to England because that you know if you learn if you knew English you you were educated. If you knew English you would you would get far in life, you know, um, because that was a colonized mind. Um, and I think um, we need you know I don't know if there is another language that is equal to English. But I think just letting people know that it's it's just one language, not not the language, which is what I grew up with. Yeah, I I think like to just and now I'm I feel like I'm coming on both of those all all of these most recent uh, ideas and just kind of pulling it together a little bit with <laughs> this this notion that first of all I think like the courage, as Tom said, the courage for you to share the personal is, is, is a humanities vibe to me that we do so much. And I'm so happy that you were here to share that and to teach us all about that kind of courage about bringing the personal into what it is we do. Cause I think it's a false kind of dichotomy to say that they were ever separate in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. But I love that the fact that the humanities are at least more open to start to admit that we need to bring this all back together. And <clears throat> something that you said earlier too really resonated with me was like that, and this is going back to that revision, slowing down to listen to the stories. That's something that's, I, I'm not gonna say that's something that the humanity, only the humanities does, but it's something that we do really well and we were denying it for so long, I think, in a certain sense. And now it's time to start bringing that back. And I think you've shown us a way to how we can do that, to listen to our stories. Um, 
to listen to the stories of our students and also to listen to the story in a way where we can be okay with it not being perfect the first time and yeah. to revising and right. to understanding that revision is part of our histories and that it, that, that it needs to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so I would very much uh, just love to thank you for, for bringing this all together today yeah. in this way where we got this space again as a community to talk about this. Um, so that's, that's what I'd like to say. No, thank and you. and with, uh, we're, we are right up against four o'clock. Okay. So I wanna be respectful of everybody's time, but I wanna again, thank Farah. I, I, I pronounce your name two different ways though. <laughs> I don't know if anybody noticed that just to see, just you know, to see how it felt, but I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, but we are up against four, but thank you so much. Um, we're not going to obviously close the room out and kick anybody out, but I just want to be respectful. And, um, and, and again, we'll, we'll clap and I wish we were all together. But thank you so much, Farah. This is awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules. And uh, we will share the, uh, the resources, right? So you have yes, that. Yes, the, the please resources. do. Yeah. Yeah, we will definitely be sharing that out with everybody. I think that was awesome as well. So yeah. thank you, everyone.